The manor of Carpathia, I bid you. <laughs> you sure you want to be here? Perhaps. We're here for you. Oh, okay. I'm sure I want to be here. <laughs> I can be pretty scared. Okay. Familiar faces. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> uh. well, welcome everyone to our panel here with the fantastic Zandor Workoff here. He's uh, the, the Dracula of uh, the 1970s. And uh, he's, he's here to talk to us about that film. And I know you got a video presentation you're going to be doing here. A little short, yeah. And, but, so I, I want to, let's go right into it, like, because it's an interesting story, I think. How did you become involved with this movie, with Dracula vs. Frankenstein to begin with? Because you were not an actor at that time. Well, I knew a little bit, but I, I've done a few you know, low budget things with other people. Um, the direct answer is um, I was in New York City, and uh, someone knew that I had friends on Wall Street. You all know uh, Sam and Al, right? When I say Sam and Al, do you know who they are? If you don't, raise your hand. <clears throat> Sam was the producer of all the movies uh, prior to this one. They made about 135 or something. And Al was the director. And they had made some, you know, low budget movies. And uh, they worked with named people who have, you know, were retired, let's say, for various reasons. And they were looking to do their own film distribution, and they somehow, someone who knew me, who knew them, said there's this guy who has friends on Wall Street. That's the short story. So we were put together in New York. Sam lived in New Jersey, and Al lived in Hollywood, and, uh, we got together a couple of times to talk about what they want, which is what happens when you're asking for money. And about the third time, <clears throat> excuse me, Al was sitting next to me, Sam was sitting across me, we're at a restaurant we used uh, Upper East Side, and uh, I'm noticing Al is just kind of slumped in his chair. This is a guy who is a very competitive guy, a sports guy, I said, what's with you? And, he, and Sam says, oh, we lost Carradine. You know who Carradine is? John Carradine, and who had done a number of films for him before them, and played Dracula. And so, um, out of nowhere, he turns to him and he said, he'll do it. And his partner, Sam, the producer, says, he'll do what? <coughs> No, he do, he'll do it, you know, take a look at him. <laughs> <laughs> exactly how I am now, only I didn't have this. It was darker. <laughs> Best pair of any drugs. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, the long and the short of that piece is Sam wasn't in it for at all. And Al said, I have a feeling. And boy, was he right. Surprise the hell out of me. <laughs> anyway, I, I surprised them. I said, I have no interest in horror. I don't go to horror movies. Sorry, guys. And so Al, being Al, said, I have a feeling, man, you know, this will be an adventure. And he kind of talked me into it. So I said, all right, I'll do it. And it was a great experience. It was weird, but it was great. So that's, does that answer yeah, yeah, the question? Because yeah. yeah. the film had not started out to be a Dracula film at all. It was supposed to be a sequel to Satan Sadist, which was the biker right. film, and, which was a very popular biker film that they did that made them, they, they made a lot of money on those biker films, those two guys. Yeah, they, yeah, they did. Uh, that was, I think, the biggest thing they had before, before, 
my entry, I guess. Um, they had backers, and the backers saw a film before the Russ's film, which was the second one. The backers said, this stinks, forget it. So then they went, you know, being tenacious, they went back and they did the biker film. They got Russ back, you know, to do that. Russ Hamlin, yeah. This get rid of this stuff. And they're so tenacious. And Sam was schooled in every aspect of, of filming. He was knew everything. And he, he the story goes, he heard something in the second film film, I believe, about Dr. DeRay, okay, and uh, he went back to his lab and started working stuff, and he wrote the story that became Dracula versus Frankenstein. He realized, he researched that there's never been a film where one was pitted against the other, so he had a, that going for him. Being the talented guy he was, he wove this story together, and he would take no for an answer, and so it's three movies, three films edited into one. So John Bloom, this seven-foot guy who they gave uh, lifts in his shoes to make him even more ominous, and uh, me, they brought us in at the end, and we became the third movie. So, it was a curious journey, and one that uh, boggles my mind. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Sam Sherman and Al Adamson, legendary exploitation filmmakers, low-budget filmmakers, they, they did so many movies. And like you said, Sam was just an all-around mm -hmm. like knowledge, base of knowledge, and Al was a real go-getter director. I mean, he was, he was, he was a specimen of, of a man, too. He was not just a, like some you know, got on the street, he, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit. He had a, he had a horrible end, unfortunately, Al mm -hmm. Anderson did. That was really sad. Um, so you get there, you're on set. Are they feeding you stuff daily? Are they feeding you stuff? Have they got a whole script together? Because, you know, it's cobbled together. How about, yeah, how about uh, eight by ten pieces of paper with typing on it? And the typing did include commas, so I had these long things. <laughs> and I didn't get it for a while, so I got short breath doing something. And we went here, and they went there, and we went... <laughs> I said, this isn't working, you know. So he said, improvise, which we did. Quite a bit, yeah. And, and the, your voice is very interesting in the film because you have that reverb on it, that echo on your voice. No, that's how I actually talk. <laughs> <laughs> I only on film. Was that was that like something that they came to you and said anything that's about? Sam. It? Sam. Sam was mother hen, and I hopefully I've said this repeatedly, and I hope he doesn't hear it because he's been kind of a mentor to me since I got back into this. Um, he would, you know, he would pay attention, and if he saw something. Gimmicks, that's what he was about. He was about gimmicks. And that's how he sold all the movies. You know, he would come up with a gimmick and they'd use it. So he would wander around and he'd wait, wait, don't do anything now. So they put a light under me. And action, so I do whatever the action was and I blink. And so cut, and I said, you guys saw I blinked. He said, no, we'll cut it. Did they? <laughs> so he left it in purposely, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, anything that worked. So he did that with the sound. Um, one day I was talking and I didn't hear any reverb, and the next day I'm going, where's that coming from? <laughs> you know. You live with it. You, live. you gotta love Sam. <laughs> so in this particular film, Al was mainly just directing at that point. And yeah, then, yeah, I mean, they conferred, yeah. you know, and Sam has said all along, Al would do anything he asked him to, yeah. you know, because he was so focused on being a creative filmmaker. His father was a legend, Denver Dix. He was a, a star in his own right, a silent film star. He. Al didn't want to do the Hollywood trip, he wanted to do his own trip, so he was definitely driven uh, to make, a, make something his own, so he would do whatever it took. 
Anybody see the uh, documentary about Al? So you saw in that, I think at one point they said he delivered papers to pay his, what he could to his actors. Yeah. He cared about the movies. He cared about what he was doing. And that was, that shows. Um, because what a lot of people don't understand about Al and, and Sam is that they would see things in the same way that Roger Corman kind of did. They would see that this market wasn't being served. Like these teenagers, nobody was making movies for teenagers at that time. And so then they started making movies for teenagers. And then as stuff got popular, Hollywood would just copy it. They'd make their own films. And then by, by that time, Sam and Al would be on to the next <laughs> thing. Right? They'd all be gone from doing biker movies to horror movies to you know all of that kind of stuff. So had you ever been on a film set before you got there? Um, let me think about that. No, no I've been part of someone else's film, but not on the set. Yeah, I haven't been. Haven't been no. okay. Had you done like theater or anything like that? I, I did theater. Yeah, yeah. I, I had you know, come, kind of come up in that, and I had gotten back from Vietnam, and that's why I was in New York. I had a girlfriend, and so I came back to New York, and all this happened. <laughs> So I, I just I'm interested. What was your first impression when you walked on the set and they started directing you? Like, did you think, "What am I doing?" Or did you think, "Like, this is amazing"? Or what? what? No, it was amazing. I mean, I I you know I, I I knew how to act. I knew the basics of acting, and uh, I can take direction. And I've seen enough movies to see how things look. And I have friends who were in movies, so it was. You know, people ask me along the same line of your question, how did you prepare? I wore the cape that Bella Lugosi wore in Abbott and Costello, that Abbott and Costello, meet Frankenstein. Frankenstein. Yeah. And so I put on the cape and off I go. I got the energy from the cape. <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting you say that, and I'm not going to bore these people with this stuff, but I feel like when I put the costume on for my TV show, that's when I really become that person. It's go. not just talking to people. Like once you have that costume on, then you feel like you're someone different. And it's hard to explain to people. Like I've become a different person almost. And so uh, it, it's really interesting that you know uh, that kind of how that acting <coughs> works. Like I, I never really understood it until we started doing the TV show, and then I was like, oh, I can do these things. And, and did you feel like you grew as a film actor over the course of that? I mean, was was it a pretty quick yeah. show? It was, you know, it was pretty loose, and Al was really good because he didn't push anybody. He let them do so. In the entire film, the only uh, direction Al gave me is at the end of the movie, where we're up in the church, and then I have a little dance with the Frankenstein monster, <laughs> and you know, so the dance was I would grab him, <laughs> and so I would do stuff like this, and his direction was cut cut the weight waving around, it won't play on film. You know, in theater you can do what you want, but on film it's too big. So I learned to bring it in, which made it easier for me to tear them apart. <laughs> and I'm a gentle guy. My friends and family said, how did you do that being who you are? He said, action, so I did it. <laughs> so I have to live with that. <laughs> <laughs> and and what, after you made that film, and I know you made another film with Al, did you did you think about continuing in acting? And, and well, acting yes, but I I made it real clear. I the horror genre wasn't you. my thing. It has become my thing, and I'm a, becoming a voice for the value of the horror community, and a little bit of the six minute film. Uh, we're going to show at this afterwards. Give me some time so I have enough to do an intro with it. Yeah. We'll get you, we'll get you there. Yeah. yeah, we're good. It's, you're at 5.45 right now. How much? We're, we're five, five. We're, 5.45. Yeah, we're at a quarter to six, so we have plenty of time. Oh, yeah. good. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> I'm fascinated by it being three movies that were put together. I know that happened a lot in those days, because people would shoot this footage and the movie wouldn't work, but they would be like, we're gonna, you know, a guy like Ted V. Michaels would take his family on vacation to Hawaii, but he'd bring the camera so he could shoot exteriors so that he could use them in his films later, and he'd write it off as a 
business expense to take his family to Hawaii. You know, that's kind of the stuff that these guys did. Um, and, and, but Sam and Al were really a, a factory almost in the fact that they were, they were doing these productions very quickly and they were getting these movies out and they were mainly playing in drive-ins and grind houses and things like that, which was a whole different scene back then. I, I was lucky enough to be born in 1969, so I did get to live through the drive-in era for a while, and I really enjoyed that experience, and I know Atlanta still has a great drive-in in the Starlight, but did, did it change your life after this movie came out, or did, did you think, it like, did people come up to you? Did, did anybody recognize you? This, if, some of you might know this, but I said, thank you very much, see ya. Yeah. And uh, I had other things that I was doing, and it was many years later, I got a phone call. I was publishing a magazine, in, uh, living in Asheville, North Carolina. And uh, I get a phone call, and my, the people in my office were, heard me say, how'd you get my number? And they stopped. <laughs> was, was about. And it turns out, Al, uh, Sam gave this guy my number. He was a fan. He wanted to interview me. And uh, I said, I'm really not into this. Give me your number. And I'm going to call Sam and see where this is going. So I called Sam. And I said, why are you giving my number up? And he said, don't you know what's going on? And I said, about what? He said, go online and, and call me back afterwards. So I go online, and I see the worst Dracula ever, <laughs> and other lovely things. And I went, oh, okay, Sam. So I called Sam back, and I said, thank you, Sam. <laughs> and I said, what is it? He said, don't, no, don't pay attention to that. He, he said, you got fans all over the world. sold the television rights to MGM, and a lot of these people are professional. They're doctors, they're lawyers, and they love this stuff, and you're probably some of them. <laughs> and they don't want everybody to know that they have a love for horror. <laughs> I said, well, you know, it's just not my, you know, Sam, it's not my thing. He said, stick around, and you and I will talk some more. I've got some ideas. And so he kind of started mentoring me a little bit. And he actually, uh, had me scheduled to do Chiller Theater at the very beginning, and he got me a press agent, and we talked about stuff, and we're all ready to go, and there was a thing called the Twin Towers falling, and it stopped everything. And so it's like, well, that's a sign, you know? And so I forgot about it. And, you know, little things showed up, and I think the final thing that happened is David Gregory from Severn Film, mm -hmm. He got in touch with me and he said, I want to interview for this documentary I'm doing. And I said, who are you? <laughs> and he said, well, uh, when I was about 12 years old, I'm British, I, and my partner, we loved films, so we were at the video store in London or wherever they were, and your film kind of jumped off the shelf at me. And once I took a look at this, I said, he said, I, this is what I want to do, and boy, has he done it, big time. So um, it's interesting how these things unfold, the connections that happen. If people are present and open to things that may have possibility. The big thing that people don't understand about me is I gave into this because how many people go to Hollywood to be in films? and never get close. And I'm being offered the lead role, as it turns out, in something that wasn't my cup of tea, but I said yes to it. And from what Sam tells me, it is the highest grossing of all their films, and I have become the most popular person. I mean, even beyond Russ and, and Lon Chaney Jr., they all know these names, and I'm different, I'm weird, I have, uh, what is it? What do you call it? A, a lot of hair and a goatee. <laughs> a fro. A fro. <laughs> That's what it was. You know, they, they called you the Frank Zappa. Oh, yeah. Zappa. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Frank Zappa. Zappa. Well, they called me a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs>
you have to have a thick skin, I've learned. <laughs> so I'm gonna ask one last question here and let, let these people ask some questions. Um, but did you have any inkling that in 2024 we'd be sitting here talking about Dracula versus Frankenstein? Um, not in the least. Where am I? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, because at that time there was no there was no home video. I mean, Super 8 maybe, but there was no home video. Then that came along and that made a lot of these films reemerge that people could see them again, finally see them. And then when the internet came along, it just kind of blew up. Right. Because everybody had access to everything, right. which was a, a, which is a crazy thing to me being it. I kind of, I, I love it and I also hate it because I was one of those people who would always seek out these strange films. And, you know, I was going through thrift stores and antique stores and looking through these old VHS tapes trying to find interesting things. And so it's got to be kind of gratifying that now that people love this film and they love you in this film because because it is such an interesting performance and it is such a, a it's a really, um, I don't know what the best word, I guess it's a contrast in that film because it is such a, a kind of a mishmash film, but your your sequences definitely stand out and that's, that's a, that's a, that's a I mean, that is a compliment, for sure. So, does anybody have any questions? I want to let you guys ask some questions, too. No questions? No questions? we got one right here. Uh, how many takes would you typically do? I know it's a below-budget film. Sometimes, obviously, time is money. But would you have to do take after take? Or? Not in the least. I don't remember doing many takes at all. <laughs> <laughs> low budget means low budget. <laughs> you are a professional, sir. You should have st stuck with acting. <laughs> One take. <laughs> One take. <laughs> yes, sir. When was the first time you saw it? Did you see the theater or did you see it on TV? Um, I don't recall, but I, I know when I saw it, I went and got some chin and a little tonic, and I went, what? <laughs> okay. You know, I roll with it. I, I, I listen to my heart. I, I'm an intuitive person. I am very mindful, and I am looking to do something meaningful in the world. And I have come from someone who said no, 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 to someone who is going to use my celebrity to do some good in the world. And I'm going to give you a taste of it when it's time. So I have one more question I just thought. Where, where did you guys film it? And was it studio stuff? Or it was you? studio. It was a small studio, uh, Upper Hollywood uh, Boulevard. Regina, you know who Regina is, the actress? Her father had a, um, one of these stool cafes, these shops, coffee shops, and it went through the alley to the studio, so it was very convenient. Her father was the first person you saw in the movie. He was the guard, the night guard, and he was the first person I took a bite on. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, you're not a horror fan, but uh, you shared a ride in the movie with Forrest okay. J. I'm oh, sorry. You're not a horror fan, but you shared a ride with Forrest J. Ackerman in the movie. And he is part of the reason why I'm a horror fan, because of the fact that sponsor was a film man, which you, you graciously signed earlier, but the magazine. But uh, can you tell those scenes? Can you tell say anything about those? About which piece? The scene with Forrest J. Ackerman in the movie. The time I spent in the car, the car scenes. Well, that's one of my favorite parts. <laughs> Do you remember what happens? We're driving. I hypnotize him mentally. Turn left. And what kind of vampire gives direction? <laughs> <laughs> Fun. Got to have a sense of humor. There's a man back there. Yes, sir. Do you have any regret for scaring the hell out of me when I was a kid? <laughs> I didn't hear the end. I said, do you have any regret, regret for scaring the, hell out, of scaring the hell out of him when he was a child? Uh, not in the least. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know I was going to. And you know, so many people 
Uh, that's part of what I'm going to tell you about. So many people, and mostly men, have told me, big strapping guys like you, six, seven, ten years old, I have one, the man who does my website, said he was six years old, he's a, and he said it took me three watchings to see the film. He said I couldn't, yeah. and I heard that from a lot of men. Yes, sir. They use the original, like, lot, the, the lights for the laboratory in the original Frankenstein films, didn't they? You know anything about that? Is that true? I mean, the spring fan, the, everything that was hot? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was Sam. Sam you know, has all these connections. It's definitely an homage to the, you know, the old films. I mean, it's well, Sam Irvin, you know, was telling me, you know, he's made been involved in a lot of this, and he said the strict fat thing was in this and this and this, and he said you're part of a group of people who had the benefit. I would walk on the set first time. I heard it was there, I didn't know what it was, so I walk out ready to shoot the next scene and one of the people said, move quick, get away from that thing, it is live, you'll be toast, <laughs> fried chicken or something, whatever he said. So I did. And, and those same instruments would go on to be in Mel Brooks's you know, Frankenstein. Yeah, so Mel Brooks, yeah, yeah, so one of them, it, yeah. It was, it's interesting because I've got a piece of mine out there that I own, the Plan 9 from Outer Space costume right, right, right. For, that, that Bunny Breckenridge wore in the movie. And um, it's cool because it's not assigned to Bunny Breckenridge, it's from Western Costume. It's clear that they just went into Western Costume in LA and rented it. That is where I was. Yeah, yeah that's then, where I rented the, this. This, yeah. this was done in. Uh, anybody's Halloween shop. <laughs> yeah, that's where this came from. What about John Bloom? I mean, what, what, any good stories about John Bloom, you know, when you were fought with him? Well, I guess people haven't heard the one of the most famous. The, the opening of the movie, how many have seen the movie? Yeah. The opening of the movie is the graveyard. And I come in there to retrieve the Frankenstein monster who was in the casket. So I open the casket after I take a bite out of the card and lift him up and he just does this. Well the story was, you know, he was an accountant and it was tax time. So he was doing taxes in the evening after doing an all day shoot, then this round robin. He was fast asleep. <laughs> when I lifted him up, I woke him up. And that was the great story. <laughs> Anybody else have questions out there? Yes. Yeah, yeah so you, you were saying you were originally not a fan of horror. And, One um, more time. Yeah, you, you were saying that originally you were not a fan of horror. So, you know, I'm wondering because you pull horror out so superbly. What was it that you were aspiring for? Like, I mean, what sort of actor, what sort of genre? You know, like, did you envision you What I was inspiring? Yeah. I was just doing that and doing, I was basically doing a favor for Al and Sam and having a good experience. I was, I think, 25 years old. I just came back from Vietnam. I was just knocking on wood. I'm still here. Why not, you know? Uh -huh. So I had my aspirations was, uh, this is an adventure. I could care less after that, basically. And I went back to a life I was living, you know. Yeah, I, I have a question, though. Um, I'm, I'm friends with Dr. George Hardy. You guys know who Dr. George Hardy is? Dr. George Hardy starred in one of, truly one of the worst films ever made, Troll 2. And, and, he, and he never acted before. He was in Salt Lake City, and they cast him in this movie. He plays the father, and he has these famous lines that are really bad, like, you can't piss on hospitality, I won't allow it, or he's tightening his belt to control his hunger pains. I mean, just, it's horrible. But George, George did the movie and he put it away and he said, I never want to hear about this again, ever. I don't ever want, and, and all of a sudden people started, like he became a dentist. And so they would, they would come to him and they would be like, Dr. Hardy, we were watching TV last night and I swear we saw you in a movie. Did that ever happen to you? Did you ever have this kind of look for people? Because I know you didn't really talk about it or weren't were really interested. But did people recognize you yeah, in public? Yeah, people, um, when I lived in L.A. and Hollywood, yeah. they, they did. Uh, so many people that were my friends and even my wife, 
uh, it was her sister who discovered that I had done this, and she's a big horror fan, and she said, I think I might have seen you. <laughs> so she's a big support, you know, she's got a whole, they did a Dracula doll and all these posters and stuff. She's got a par portion of the house that's, <laughs> that's got all this stuff, and I go, really? <laughs> But I am, I'm very grateful. It's, it's opened up uh, a whole world for me that if things go right, I will be able to do some meaningful work. And uh, that's really I, what I think we're here for. And you, you folks are probably doing it already in your own way. And I consider you a community. And that's part of what I'm talking about. When I talk to people, and I say, well, what are you doing with these people? And I said, what do you mean, these people? You know, and, and they say, well, they're weird, they're tattooed, they pierce it. So what's wrong with that? Just because you're not, you know, they're people, they're human beings, and they, you know, you need to learn more about this. And so I decided I'm going to do things that will make that clear to people. And that first convention that you did, what what was that experience like for you? Did because you, you said you you know you see these people with the tattoos and the earrings. Did did you even grasp at the beginning of how much love there was for you? I didn't. I didn't. I started at Schiller in New Jersey, and my, it was the one that my wife was able to come to, and she sat and watched you folks come to meet me. It was the first time ever. And she saw, what she said is she saw this look in, you know, fans' eyes like, you know, and when they got to the table, I do what I'm doing now. I like people. And so I tell stories and if people laugh. I say, okay, that's a good thing. And I'm committed to being what they cast me as, the, the con what is it, the, the new, there's a word for it, uh, you know, it may come to me, it may not, but it's the timely Dracula. I was the Dracula for the times. And uh, postmodern. <laughs> anyway, uh, there's a well. Part of what I am doing, I did a podcast with a couple of people who are considered the voices of the history of horror. John Kidley, if you know who he is, I did a podcast. I was on their show. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we had this kind of conversation about how people respond, and once they have an interaction, what that means, and things of this nature. And I'm here to uh, contemporary, contemporary. I'm the, uh, I think that's what Al had in mind. I'm a contemporary Dracula, because I didn't look like Bella and uh, Christopher Lee and all the other people. That I, I think the, the thing is there's 85 men who literally played Dracula in films, not wore a costume for Halloween, and everybody had their own little flavor. And they call me the drive-in Dracula and the, and the contemporary Dracula for our times. So I like that, you know, it's, I'm really proud to be that person. So I've come a 180 degrees, and I, I look forward to what comes next for all of us. And you made the cover of Famous Monsters. Anything about that? No, 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 you made the cover of Famous oh, Monsters. Oh, yes, yes, I didn't even know that it was. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't something I read, so it's like, oh, Forey, wow. When did you take that picture? <laughs> well, Forey gave you great coverage, I mean, because he was, in, he was involved in the making of the film. And he came up with Xandor Vorkoff, as He's I understand it. He named me. He named you that, and, and so, and you didn't have you didn't have a girlfriend on the set at that time, did you? Uh, no. Okay, I good. Have yes. a wife. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> you are already married. No, to actually, no. I, nobody was. Nobody was. With okay, me. I was just going to say because you had to watch Forty if that happens. So anyway, <laughs> love Forty, but yeah. So. Would, if they came to you today and they said, we're going to make another Dracula versus Frankenstein movie, we're going to make a sequel, would you jump in that now? It depends. You know, <laughs> you've got to be judicious and let me read it. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
there is going to be uh, something that's being uh, starting in January. Sam and uh, a man named David Sering, who works with him, they're going to, I think they're going to do a graphic novel. And I have the poster out there for it. And uh, he told me the story, and I went, boy, are you going to get an audience for this? It is the wildest, craziest thing you can imagine. Unlike anything that happened, it, it is so out of the box crazy. I don't even remember. I mean, I, I play this someone out of uh, <coughs> character, I guess, who does really weird things. And and uh, Regina, the the actress, they have her cast in some power person, you know. So she has the power, and I have something, you know. And so it's. Watch for it. Uh, I don't know what they're naming. You can look at the poster and, uh, and see what it is. That's awesome. They have something new coming. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, did you work with Lon Chaney much on the No, film? again, right. three three films. So I worked with. Uh, I'm losing my food. Yeah. With John, mainly. Yeah. And uh, no, no, with uh, Jay uh, Nash. Yeah. I worked with him, and yeah, uh, not with uh, Lon or Russ, or was, oh, An well, I worked with Angela the Dwarf, and uh, yeah, it was whoever showed up and they told me what to do, it's okay. like, okay. How, how long was the shoot that you were on? How long did y'all spend doing that? Uh, what do you mean in terms of now? No, in terms of shooting at that time. How many, was it quick? I mean, was it like a week well, I or was, something? I was uh, staying with uh, uh, Al and Gina, and I think I was there a week. Okay. So it was a week worth of shooting. And we shot at night, too. And did you stay in touch with with Sam and Al after that? I mean, sure. I know you said Sam, you, no, you did no. for sure. Alan invited me to his house in Palm Springs, and he used to shoot hoops and... You know, it's just one time. I mean, it was just a little bit, but um, he had a life that was different than mine. He's still making horror movies. I wasn't committed yet, you know. Thank God they didn't catch me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's the story. So then, what, what are your favorite movies? What movies inspired you? Well, in those days, my, you know, my mother's an artist, and so I grew up on um, European films and uh, you know, not being of a violent nature, regardless of what I did in that movie, um, you know, I, I just look for things that are meaningful, that touch me, that have some value, and not this stuff that's on the streets, especially today, it comes at you nonstop, you know, and it's like, how healthy is that, you know? I just don't understand it, so I don't try to understand it. I try to make a difference. And did you ever get to meet Russ and Lon? I met Russ, no, not Lon. Because Best Boy shortly after yeah, that. They yeah, they both died right after. I met Russ at one of these things, and he was a character. <laughs> Anybody else? There's a clip uh, that we're going to show up like that. Uh, no? Oh, he's going to show something here at the end, yes. Are we done? I can give you a little in. we got, we got a couple more minutes. If anybody else has any more questions, then we'll. Then we'll go on that. Yes, sir. It's not really a question. I was just, I guess, fortunate I got to see it at the drive in back in 1981. It was uh, part of a uh, Dust the Dawn horror film. I don't know if you're from, anybody here is from this area that's playing at the uh, South Expressway drive in in Forest Park. I don't think anybody's familiar with that. But they had uh, like Shriek and Amelia was playing, Creature from the Black Lake. They're coming to get you. And I remember I was watching it, and I watched it more too than I passed out. <laughs> I was nine years old. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> See, I use everything. I have stories to tell. I weave this stuff together as long as my memory still works. So, you know, you're all part of a very meaningful situation. And so what I'd like to do is give a little Backstory. I've told a few of you who've come to my table the gist of this. Um, 
what I, uh, one of the things I've done, I was part of this international theater company called Playback Theater, which is basically, we, you tell a story, we play it back. And uh, it's a very, it, 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 it addresses, it gives a voice to a lot of people who don't get to be heard, you know, because they get to come up and tell a story and choose the actors to play the different roles, you know. And so that was step one, and that was very meaningful. And I, I uh, had this publication, I was doing playback, and it was during the buildup under a certain president who I think they locked up. I, I don't remember, he was the son of someone who was a president. <laughs> I'm not gonna name names and cast the guys. Uh, but anyway, a number of people were leaving the United States, and they, you know, these are people of means and everything else, and they didn't want to live here because they were. This president kept talking about, "I'll do whatever it takes to protect us," and he was looking for bombs. He was looking for something. So a lot of people got nervous and were moving out. And I said, "There's something wrong with this picture. I don't get what this is about." And so. Um, because of the playback aspect, um, I realized, you know, there's playback companies on every continent and many, many countries. So I called the man who was the head of all of this and I said, I've got an idea to take all the playback companies and on a very special day, have us all do playback in our own culture based on the theme of kindness. And one of my cast members said, uh, kindness, we're going to get fluffy stories, you know. I said, oh, how about we do stories of kindness and missed opportunities for kindness? I said, that's it. So we did this, and it was very worthwhile. So uh, a man that you'll see in this film, uh, he's a esteemed author. He just finished a movie with... Uh, Lou Gossett Jr. and Ed Asner before they passed, and a lot of other people. And he was a big Zandor fan, and we become friends. And so he introduced me to the man who runs the peace and justice arm of uh, uh, Marquette, you know, yeah, Marquette. And so uh, I brought in two women from Chicago playback, and I said, instead of doing the standard Q&A, Let's do a little playback and do these short forms and answer their questions in action. So he said, great idea. So we did that. And so my friend said, when we uh, bring your cape, when you do, I said, what does my cape and Dracula have to do with this? He said, trust me. So we did had four performances, and the, the last one was the evening on a big stage with people who sat in the back of the audience because they heard they might be you know, asked to come up and do something they were uncomfortable doing. So uh, he said, trust me, and we were into improv, so trust me, I said, all right. So what you're gonna see is what this is about. And it's, it's about, well, let me, let's show this, and let me have a few minutes afterwards to wrap it up after you see this. The sound, we were wearing lavalier mics, and so I don't know how the sound's gonna operate, but. It's six minutes, so see what we have. some sound.
How do you like it so far? <laughs> Closed caption would be nice right now. Don't touch the snail, but the CD is the DVD. That draws 100% blank, so it's not going to go any louder. Just to when you see the people, not the titles, please. Gotcha. Yeah, that's good. One, two. No, there's more people. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs>
Thank you. That doesn't answer my question. What are you doing? Yes, I'm here to explain why you've been so important to me. When I was a kid, I was bullied a lot because I didn't really think. And I went through a lot of rejection, like you have, I guess, and a lot of shaming, and my classmates just kind of pushing me around. Oh. Saying I didn't fit in, shunning me. What are you doing here? Just like what they do to you. Get on. And as I got older, I came to see that you, Wolfman, and Frankenstein, once are all these characters and the movies I love. I think I love them because I was like them, or they were like me, rejected. And it really is to me. Those people doing that to me didn't have. <laughs> oh my God! I'm not putting myself on your level. I'm just saying that your example was an inspiration. What I'm here to do is simply tell you that story and say thank you, Kent. And and please don't fight me. <laughs> Is that all you have to say? Just wanted to give you my gratitude. These two are waiting to give you their gratitude now. Well, then, it's not that I'm, not that I'm done talking. I think my lead is safe, right? You're very brave when you show up in this way. You're very brave. Thank you. It's interesting because when you talk about this, one of the things that I've found in the horror community is that people are very kind. Yes. They're very understanding. They they embrace everyone. And that's a lovely thing. Everybody raise their hand if you've ever been bullied in your life. <laughs> yeah. 
that's what it's all about. That is what it's about. And let me jump in for the sake of time. Based on this, this was all improv. This is my friend who said, bring your cape. I had no idea what was going to happen. And since that, it just, you know, when, when he brought that forth, like bells and whistles went off. And bullying is everywhere you can imagine. You know, even the slightest thing. And the idea that the horror community provided an outlet early on in the films, I imagine, I did a little bit of research I've begun with the other people who are working with me on this concept, um, have noticed that predominantly men, uh, because you know men are thought to be big, hairy guys who can do this and if you're you know, sensitive, you're you know, creative, you're wearing stuff in your ears, uh, you know, my two friends helping me here, you know, they're pierced, they got tattoos all over their body. They're, one's a, a big time teacher who really cares about kids, and he's all over the place with it. So you can't judge, but they get bullied. We all have gotten bullied by people who are bullies because they've not been listened to and they little by little get welcome if people listen to them. They don't have to join the horror community to do that. This is a community for people who really have, you know, a vested interest in a variety of ways. It's a place to have community. And so I'm working with uh, some folks to bring this concept forward. How do we stop bullying? We stop bullying in the community. My cat, no, I don't have a cat, that was uh, Aaron. My dog bullied me. You ready? I got two young dogs, live uh, where there's a big hill in the back of the house. Every evening we let the dogs out before we go to bed. So my wife periodically would, uh, I hear her yelling up the hill. She'd take a flashlight like, trying to get the the, the female in, she, the female is, you know, she's kind of in her own world and enjoying the outdoors whenever she felt like it. And I said, I'm not going to do that. I do too much and I need my rest. So um, I found a way to get her in. But she was bullying me. She was keeping me up. She was, you know, making me kowtow to her. Power over. Wherever there is power over, look for a bully. And there's no way you're going to stop someone from, from being who they are other than by example and, you know, coming up with something in the moment or walking away, you know, coming up with something to say, hey, you know, we don't need to do that or whatever it is that comes to mind. And, you know, it takes two people to go at it. So if you get any energy out of this concept, you know, let's see where it goes. I'm going to keep doing this because I've found already people are going, I never thought of that. Well, now you heard it, so do something, man. You know, don't, don't add to it. You know, don't bully somebody else because they're in your face or you, you don't like somebody. It always starts like that. And I have to go inside myself every day and go, where, oh, I did it again. You know, it's one of those things. So anyway. I wanted you to have a, a, a taste of this. Did it make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Was it clear that uh, the bullying and this community could be something valuable you know, to, to look at this? And it's not going to change overnight, or maybe it is, because we're living in very tenuous times, and it's only people who have community who have other friends and resources, you know, dancing to the same song and having a good time. I mean, you, you don't come here to do weird stuff. I, this is about the fifth or the sixth uh, convention I've done or drive in, and it's always the same. And I come away with, these are such great people. You know, I can't wait to get there and listen to their stories and stuff like that. You know? <coughs> the volunteers and you know, everybody's like having a, a good time because they're with their loving family. 
So thank you very much, and keep it up. Keep, keep doing it. <laughs>